Thank you. Good morning, Suan. It is great to be here. Um, I am with the Open Infrastructure Foundation, and my name is Mark Collier. And as you might expect, as the name implies, we build open source software for infrastructure. Pretty simple. We're a nonprofit. We were backed by members all over the world, a massive ecosystem. And some examples of the software that we create are OpenStack, Kata Containers, Starling X, and Zool. And as I said, we have companies all over the world that back the foundation, our strong strategic partners, including our gold and platinum members. And today, we're excited to announce that we have our newest platinum member, Okestro, right here in Korea. But there's always room for more. So if you would like to become our newest platinum member, call me, and we'll help you make it happen. We also have silver members all over the world. And one of the groups that is very exciting is our associate members. These are academic and research institutions all over the world that are helping to advance the technologies we work on and build the next generation of talent for all of your companies to hire in a few years. So these are very important organizations as well. And it's not just about companies. It's also about all of the people, all of you. And the Open Infra Foundation has over 100,000 individual community members in almost every country in the world. This is the true power of open source and what Open Infra Foundation is all about. Now, I mentioned that OpenStack is probably uh, our most well-known open source software for infrastructure. And this software has uh, had over 600,000 code changes from 10,000 developers in, from hundreds of organizations. This is really critical when you think about how we as a foundation, as a community, build the software for the next generation of infrastructure. This is exactly how we've done it before and how we're going to continue to do it. And that makes OpenStack one of the most active open source projects in the world today. And it's also a process we've created for additional software, all the new software. We kind of think of it as a factory for producing software. And it's a major engine for innovation. And the way that we do this is very much about building a coalition of many, many individuals and companies all over the world. What we're doing is not single vendor open source. Other people are doing that. That's not what we're doing. We're about bringing all the different companies together, deciding what needs to get created, and managing that as a foundation, as a community, to produce great software. And obviously, we are big believers in open source. Harvard recently did a study which showed that open source in total has created $8 trillion in value, which, and I looked this up, is 12 quadrillion won. So, I'm excited to have my first keynote to mention quadrillion. So that's a, that's a first. Um, and when we think about OpenStack specifically, and we look at how big that market is, it's over $20 billion US today. And in just a few years, it's going to grow to over $90 billion, which is over 100 trillion won. And of course, it's uh, important to measure the economic impact but it's also as important when it comes to open source to get the vibes right. And so, as my daughters might say, uh, OpenStack's got Riz. With apologies to the interpreters for saying Riz. Um, I don't know what it means either, don't worry. Um, so, to give you a, a concrete example of what I'm talking about here, with just one company in Europe, Little, uh, they're part of Schwartz, which is a very large company in Europe, they have built an OpenStack public cloud. It was featured in the Financial Times a couple of weeks ago. That's uh, over $2 billion a year in revenue. And so 
we are often discovering these new clouds, and I think sometimes OpenStack is the best kept secret in infrastructure because we hear so much about Amazon and Microsoft and Google, and they're doing uh, all these impressive things, but OpenStack continues to grow um, in private and public clouds. Oftentimes, people don't, don't realize that. So what I want to talk about for the rest of the talk really is about how much the world is changing and sort of like try to make sense of it. Because I personally feel like the world is changing faster right now than ever in my lifetime. Does anybody else feel that way? Anyone else feel like it's just hard to keep up? I mean, I, every day I feel like I try to keep track of AI and all these other, other technology trends. And I think when it comes to the pace of change in the world, technology is driving most of it, right? And, and nowhere is that more um, acute or more specific than in infrastructure. So when I'm faced with lots of change, I always try to start with a simple question, which is just, what is going on here? What is the situation? So I want to try to make some sense of it today by breaking it down into four defined trends, four things that I'm tracking that I think might be relevant to you all that you may want to track as well, and specifically share how open source communities and, and organizations and ecosystems and foundations are responding, driving the change that we need to meet the challenges of all of these categories. And that's driving, by the way, that OpenStack growth that we're seeing go, go crazy up right now, and Kata containers, and other open source, Kubernetes, et cetera. So the first trend that is really creating a lot of waves and a lot of um, reactions and the need to adopt open source even more is digital sovereignty. So to kind of put this simply, digital sovereignty comes into, the, into play when you really care where your data is, where is it living, who has access to it, and what laws apply to it. So this can be, as an individual, many of you may care a lot about where your data lives and who has access to it and what lies of laws apply to it. Certainly apply, uh, applies to corporations. And increasingly what we see is because of these, these factors, governments are getting more involved. They're learning about open source. They're out there trying to create new regulations. That changes the game. This is something we have to all adapt to. So when we think about a concrete example of how open source is reacting to and helping address this specific trend, one good example would be in France. So the nine largest banks in France all run OpenStack. And the reason is pretty clear, right? It's digital sovereignty. They need to have the data in the country. They care where it lives. They have to apply uh, and comply with local laws, banking, heavily regulated industry. They also need reliable software, right? They're not going to run uh, their mission-critical uh, bank workloads where your money is stored without something they can really trust. And that's why they've turned to OpenStack. And as I mentioned before, it's not just private clouds. We have OpenStack public clouds in hundreds of data centers all over the world. And I, I think I mentioned this uh, example earlier, the Lidl cloud. But uh, this Financial Times article specifically calls out that a main selling point of its service is that all client data is processed and stored exclusively in Germany and Austria. So we see this trend throughout Europe, throughout Asia, and it continues to be a driver for interest and investment in open source, in particular OpenStack. Now, it's not just hardware, right? When you want control, you want access to technology, you want to make sure that not only do you have access, but you continue to have access. Sometimes you may lose access to technologies that you were relying on or license changes uh, out from under you. So an interesting development in the hardware space, and we have a lot of great hardware speakers later that know more than I do, but RISC-V is a very good example. This is an open source uh, design for semiconductors for chips. And recently, there was a research paper published about how to run OpenStack on RISC-V. So you can see why this trend would be rising along with the digital sovereignty trend, because people want something they know they can have access to, 
and control over where it lives and build their own infrastructure domestically and have it uh, access to it for the long haul. And in this research paper, it specifically calls out that European Union's technological sovereignty strategy centers around risk five. So this is just another example where we see open technologies being more important than ever in this changing world that we live in that's just very hard to keep up with. So the second trend is licensing changes. So to give you an example, a lot of these licensing changes, by the way, are not good for customers. <laughs> They're not good for the market. But open source is once again there to respond and react and provide the resilience that is lacking in the single vendor open source or the proprietary software world. So many of you may use Terraform. And not too long ago, the company that was the primary driver of that open source project decided to close source it. They changed the license. However, and a lot of people were upset, but open source to the rescue here. The Linux Foundation set up a new foundation, created a new project that was a fork of uh, Terraform called Open Tofu. And Oracle, not long after, was recommending their customers don't adopt Terraform, adopt the true open alternative, the fork, which has been growing very fast, Open Tofu. Now, another example would be VMware. And by the way, I want to say that these changes, when companies introduce them, oftentimes it, it really breaks trust that's been built up for years. And it's, it takes years to build trust. We know in open source, trust is huge. But you can, it can be gone in an instant. So VMware, many of you have probably been impacted by this, came to some customers and said, you're going to have to pay 10 times more. And they actually just cut off some of their partners that were trying to help VMware be successful and just said, you're, you're out. And so once again, you know, open source really responded. And we went to our members of the Open Infrastructure Foundation, and we talked to all of them. Many are, are here. And 80% and of them said they'd already had customers asking, how can I go from VMware to OpenStack? And 60% of them had already helped at least one customer migrate to OpenStack. And we've got a really cool demo about this later and a lot more to, to come on this. But it's a huge trend. And one very specific example is one of the largest, the second largest insurance company in the United States. It's called Geico. It's actually owned by Warren Buffett, who you may know. And uh, so they, they take great care in their choices of how they manage their money and how they manage their infrastructure. And they recently built a massive OpenStack cloud. Um, and we have a white paper about VMware to OpenStack migration. We just published today. QR code is here, so you can find it. But it specifically dives into the Geico example, and I think it's a great one. So check that out. So the third trend are security concerns. Now, I think you all have to deal with this on a day-to-day -day basis. And one stat that really caught my eye recently is that 87% of container images uh, in production have critical or high severity vulnerabilities. That's a pretty scary stat. And so the example where open source is responding is a project that our foundation hosts called Kata Containers. Now, this project has been seeing massive growth recently, a, a ton of interest, because it, it solves a real world problem, which is how to secure these containers, right? And it really strikes an a balance between speed and security. And it is really a lightweight virtualization. I can't give you the whole spiel on it today, but it's lightweight virtualization. It gives you the speed of containers and the security of virtual machines. And that's why you see companies like Microsoft Azure rolling out Kata container support. Um, NVIDIA, you've probably heard of them. They're investing in, in Kata for, for GPU um, security. And most recently, um, Amazon Web Services had customers asking for Kata container support, and they wrote some documentation on how you can enable it in an AWS environment. And so the last major shift that I want to talk about in terms of you know, what is happening here, AI. You probably hear about that uh, often. Well, it absolutely is making a huge impact when it comes to security. Sorry, infrastructure. <laughs> when it comes to infrastructure investment, what technologies we need to build. And uh, 
recently a report was published in which 96% of organizations said they are investing in building new compute capacity for AI. Is this familiar to anyone? Anyone out there trying to, trying to procure GPUs, <laughs> trying, to, trying to install them in their data centers as fast as possible? This is happening at a major uh, scale, an unprecedented scale. We've never seen this type of infrastructure build out, ever. And Jensen Wong, the founder and CEO of NVIDIA, recently said that we're going to need to build another trillion dollars of infrastructure, physical infrastructure, basically data centers full of GPUs. He would probably you know, want it to be his GPUs um, in order to meet, up, meet this demand. And another way to think about this uh, when you think about the power requirements, right? We've seen an 11x increase in data center build out as measured by megawatts. And soon we'll be building gigawatt data centers. So this is a, a, a massive investment. And you'll hear more about the hardware side of it later from people that are experts on that. But it certainly means more and more software. And a lot of this is about how much data is being created, right? So a concrete example of the open source response is that in the UK, the fastest supercomputer for AI being built, it's called the Dawn supercomputer, is, um, is being run by OpenStack. And a, one of the companies that's one of those members I showed you earlier is Stack HPC, and they're helping to, to um, run that. Um, another example is Hyundai. They'll be talking later. They've built a massive uh, OpenStack cloud to power their 10 million connected cars. So we continue to see this uh, over and over again. Uh, one more example I'll give you is a company called NextGen Cloud. And that's easy to remember. NextGen infrastructure is run by this company, NextGen Cloud. They're one of the top 10 buyers of GPUs in the world, specifically these high-end GPUs for AI and machine learning. And they're also running OpenStack. And that points to the fact that OpenStack's already very popular and meeting the needs of AI workloads. However, we also see uh, and have to remember, OpenStack never sleeps. OpenStack is constantly evolving. We just had our 29th release of OpenStack, and we already um, have seen new features like vGPU live migration land. This is in the Caracal release released a few months ago. So we're constantly changing OpenStack to meet these new infrastructure demands. And the last piece that I'll mention is more on sort of what goes on top of the infrastructure. So when it comes to AI models, 96% of companies are planning to build their AI strategy, their production environment, uh, using open source models. And so uh, once again, open source is leading the innovation there. So when we think about, again, all the components needed, there's new hardware, whether it's RISC-V or uh, you know, next generation GPUs, FPGAs, all the new architectures that are coming online to support the, the workload. There's new software that has to get written and new applications, whether it's the AI models or, or other higher level constructs. And this is not new to us. 10 years ago, the telco industry said, we want to do our next generation infrastructure upgrade. It's a trillion dollar investment over 10 years. And as a result, today, nine out of 10 of the largest telcos run OpenStack. So we know how to do this, and we're going to do it again. And it starts again with uniting and forming the coalitions of the companies, figuring out what software needs to get written, and getting down to work and coordinating all that upstream work. And so if we think about this uh, challenge we see ahead of us, we think about how fast the world is changing, there is only one way that we can tackle this and we can manage this change and we can thrive in it. And open source is the way. So let's join together and make it happen. Thank you. Thank you.